Chapter 25 The Corporation and Limited Existence One of the most important concepts in the history of Western thought is the concept of the corporation. Although in Rome some aspects of the idea existed, what we know as a corporation is a biblical doctrine. A corporation is an entity which exists apart from the life of its members, is a legal person, and has a continuing existence. The word corporation comes from a Latin word meaning body. A corporation is thus a corpus, a body with a life of its own. Israel was a corporation created by God. The generation which died in the wilderness was separated from the corporation by God. Through judgments and captivity, Israel was again and again purged. The people perished, but the corporation always continued. The church, as the new Israel of God, was grafted into the corporation, and the old members were cut off, Romans 11, 17-20. Both the Old Testament Passover and Communion, the Christian Passover, celebrate the fact of corporateness. As Paul says, quote, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another, Romans 12.5. The early church thus saw itself as a body, a corporation. It was more than the sum total of its members, moreover, because the church was and is created by Jesus Christ, and its essential existence is in Christ, not apart from him. A church separated from Christ is no longer a church, but a parody of a church. The church thus is not only a corporation, it is a supernatural body or corporation, because its head and ruler is the king of all creation. The church, thus, has an existence which transcends this earth and transcends time and death. The state very early saw the threat which Christ represents. Not only is Christ Lord and Sovereign, but his is a supernatural and transcendent authority and power. The state reacted in two ways. First, from the days of the early church to the present, States have warred against the church. The idea of an allegiance beyond the control of the state and a law from beyond the state was to them anathema. Warfare between Christ and the Caesars of history has been routine. Second, the state has imitated the church and arrogated to itself the claim to be a mystical body, a corporation, or even Christ's body. Sir Edward Cook, according to Kantorowicz, took the church's doctrine of the mystical body, identified it with the state, and declared the head to be the king. Men like Blackstone stated routinely that the king never dies. The king is dead. Long live the king. Because kingship is a continuing corporation, the king is legally never underage and, quote, is not only incapable of doing wrong, but even of thinking wrong. He can never mean to do an improper thing. In him is no folly or weakness. End quote. Sir Edward Coke declared, quote, The politic capacity is invisible and immortal. End quote. As did Edmund Plowden. The king thus represents an incarnation of sovereignty and authority which is continued in the royal line without cessation. The doctrine of the divine right of kings had deep roots. We see this clearly, for example, in a case of Queen Elizabeth's day, William versus Berkeley. Justice Southcote, seconded by Justice Harper, declared according to the law report in parts, quote, The king has two capacities, for he has two bodies. The one whereof is a body natural, consisting of natural members, as every other man has, and in this he is subject to passions and death, as other men are. The other is a body politic, and the members thereof are his subjects, and he and his subjects together compose the corporation, as Southcote said, and he is incorporated with them, and they with him, and he is the head, and they are the members, and he has the sole government of them, and this body is not subject to passions as the other is, nor to death, for as to this body, the king never dies, and his natural death is not called in our law, as Harper said, the death of the king, but the demise of the king, 
not signifying by the word demise that the body politic of the king is dead, but that there is a separation of the two bodies, and that the body politic is transferred and conveyed over from the body natural, now dead, or now removed from the dignity royal, to another body natural, so that it signifies a removal of the body politic of the king of this realm from one body natural to another. End quote. The parody of the doctrine of Christ's two natures is obvious, as is the fact that the king was the claimant to Christ's sovereignty, however disguised. Kandorovitz traced the deep roots of this doctrine in medieval and earlier thought. In 1401, the Speaker of the House of Commons compared the body politic to the Trinity, with the king, the House of Lords and Commons, forming a mystical body. Because pagan Rome claimed to be a divine order, with the Senate possessing the power to make gods and the emperors declaring to be gods by the Senate, Rome was ready, after tolerating Christianity, to use biblical concepts for Christ with reference to itself. This continued in the medieval era as holy Roman emperors saw themselves as rulers over the church and as God's vicegerents. More than a few popes, usually those named by emperors, give assent to this. Pope John VIII, 872-882, in an assembly of bishops, praised the Carolingian Emperor Charles II, of whom he had high and false hopes, as, quote, the saviour of the world, end quote, whom, quote, God established as a prince of his people in imitation of the true King Christ, his son, so that what he, Christ, owned by nature, the king might attain to by grace. End quote. Before the Reformation, rulers had substantially usurped for themselves those rights which belonged to Christ and his body. With time, these claims were stated more openly. Philip II of Spain, for example, was very much a Cesaro papist. He saw himself to be the head of the Spanish Church, the protector of the Catholic Church, and the counsellor of the Pope. All the Catholic and Protestant monarchs of that era shared like Cesaro papist views. When religious toleration was promoted by the various European powers, it not only was a part of the establishment syndrome and the antithesis of religious freedom, but it had a status purpose to utilize the energies of all the sects and churches for the purposes of the state. Thus, Frederick the Great of Prussia in a decree of June 15, 1740, declared, quote, All religions are equal and good insofar as those who profess them are honest men. And if the Turks and pagans came and wanted to populate the country, we should be ready to build them mosques and temples. End quote. The state should see to it that all religions, quote, lived in peace and worked together and in equal measure for the good of the state. End quote. In the statement, Frederick I placed all religions on a par and under the state, so that the equality of religions was implied at the least before the law. The state would be ready to provide mosques, churches or temples for all. Second, Frederick's one condition with respect to all religions was this, quote, Insofar as those who profess them are honest men, end quote, as an Enlightenment philosopher king, Frederick held to the Enlightenment views on virtue as somehow a non-religious and philosophical attribute. As a result, he separated morality from religion. All religions could potentially possess that honesty which is the mark of reasonable men, but only insofar as they abandoned the heart of their faith for the natural religion of the philosophers. Third, the purpose of religious toleration for Frederick was to utilize religions, quote, for the good of the state, end quote. It should be noted that Frederick stipulated that they should all do so, quote, together and in equal measure, end quote. The function of religion had returned to the pre-Christian Roman function to provide social cement and support the state. Briefly, what happened was that, first, the state had claimed to be the transcendent and necessary corporation of man and had thus supplanted Christ as sovereign and the church as the institution with the ministry of salvation. The state and its schools now became the saving power. 
Salvationist politics and messianic education resulted. The latter I document in The Messianic Character of American Education, 1963. Second, the state now saw the function of the church to be less and less the service of Christ and more and more the service of the state. The church had to justify its existence in terms of political utility, and if this utility was not seen, the church had to be destroyed. The French and Russian revolutions worked most conspicuously towards that goal. Third, because the state was now the great community and the ultimate corporation, it began to insist that the church could only be a subsidiary corporation by virtue of a grant from the state. In the United States, the Internal Revenue Service began to grant or deny corporate status to churches. This status was given upon sufferance of the state and subject to its conditions. The church as a corporation now had only a limited existence, one conditional upon the grants and terms of the state. Limitations began to appear as to the extent of the property which could be held tax-exempt. To illustrate, a church has to have so much parking space. If, however, to cite a specific case from one city, a small fraction of an acre remains above the space allowed for parking or landscaping, this space must be taxed. The modern state has thus made of itself a new Christ and church. It has borrowed biblical concepts and used them for anti-Christian purposes. Clearly, it is time the Christian protested and a time for battle.